Hello, strangers from distant lands, friends of old. You have been summoned here to sense space, a convention of the wise, to explore a pressing hunger for myth and story in our culture today. And in the search for answers to this hunger, we're delving into the Lord of the Rings, the law of the Lord of the Rings, and inviting some of the deep, deep drums to vibrate through us and to allow some of that myth to come to life. So we're going to be exploring um, some of the deep, deep through lines of what is undoubtedly my favorite book, movie, mythos of our time, I think for Jordan as well. And, uh, and we're also going to be exploring the context of myth in life and what does it mean to have story governing our lives? What does it mean to have these deep overarching narratives, these metaphysical worlds that govern our sense of right action, good and evil, friend and foe? And so the structure for today is going to be starting with a little bit of a dropping in process letting us shift a little deeper into the space of awareness of myth and then we're going to begin a little dialogue between jordan and myself followed by some further participation uh later on hopefully we're going to be joined by ken lowry um, fortunately he had something uh emergency come up but hopefully he's going to join later on and uh, yeah i'm really looking forward to this so let's drop right in. And the best way to start in this moment is going to be a deep, deep breath. And just coming deeper into our bodies, deeper into the council of our bodies deeper into this moment. Slowing everything down. Connecting with the heart. Feeling the substance of your bones. Letting everything apart from this moment and this breath fall away. Letting this next breath open a space of liminality, of in betweenness. of dying stories and of new stories yet untold. And as you sense into the liminality of this moment, of your body, of your breath, of your very body, of your flesh. See if there is indeed something more. Is there a space of story in this moment? Are there calls for you to heed? Are there whispers? Is there a drum beat? Do you 
feel the call to fellowship. Do you feel the call to quest? Myth is potent. And we here are gathered to experience its potency. With that, taking pause at the proverbial campfire, we begin our, our exploration of the story, the exploration of the myth of the Lord of the Rings, its reality, its significance for not only our own lives, but our age and an age of crisis. So with that, I welcome a leader in liminal spaces, a space holder, rapper, coach, mystic, sometimes wizard, Jordan Bates, who, as it turns out, also she has a deep passion for the Lord of the Rings, which has united us in the fellowship of this event. So welcome, Jordan. Thank you, brother. Great to be here. Really great to have you. Just going to fade out this music as we enter into the dialogue. Mm. I have a lot to say. There's a lot of deep, deep uh, mythical marination that's been going on in the weeks leading up to this. I think I embarked on a quest bigger than I imagined. And there's a lot more in the Lord of the Rings than I initially realized. So um, I want to just start and see if, Jordan, if there's anything that's really hot for you in this moment. Otherwise, I'm happy to uh, to stop pulling on some of those ropes. I would say dive in and I'll, I'll riff in relation to you. Awesome. Awesome. One of the most powerful themes of Tolkien's work Tolkien's work was written, by the way, in the mid 20th century between the beginning of the Second World War and the end of the Second World War, around a few years afterwards. And Tolkien was able to pull together a deep Norse and pagan mythology with the deepest, deepest undercurrents of Christianity and the mythos of Christianity. And so in that context, Redemption was the first thread that really came to life for me in relation to the Lord of the Rings. It's something that in our own lives at certain points becomes necessary to our survival. We reach certain junctures where actually we are in need of redemption. We have reached some sort of impasse in our incapacity, in our fallenness, in our inability to fulfill the greater calling of our time, of our life, in all its particularity. And so in The Lord of the Rings, we see many of the core characters on this journey of redemption, beginning with Aragorn and also mirrored in Boromir in King Theoden, and also in some of the hobbits, including Pippin. And the context of today and the context of sense space and the larger project that we are involved in here, that Jordan is involved in with his men's initiatives and the forthcoming Council of Kings, I think we're really recognizing that there is an Aragorn, or rather a Strida, within all of us. There's a way in which each of us is the ranger out wandering in obscurity, not fulfilling his purpose. Fearful 
in fact, of his own power, of his own destiny. And so, so during the course of the journey of the fellowship, we see the journey of Aragon as this process of coming to overcome his own doubt in himself through vesting himself into the fellowship, through giving himself to Frodo and to the service of others. And in that process, he actually begins to come into his kingship. And what we also see is that Aragorn can't realize his kingship alone. His kingship is a collective process. It's realized through the love of his queen, Arwen, who pulls him forward. It's realized through Gandalf, through Elrond, through the hobbits, and through everybody around him who calls him forward into his greater purpose. And this is something reflected in Boromir's own wrestling, um, a character that I find particularly touching because he lives on that edge of fallenness, of evil and good and fulfilling his call. And in the end, he does fall and he does try to take the ring from Frodo. He does betray the fellowship that he's pledged himself to. And this in a way is mirroring the biblical narrative in which the closest disciples of Jesus end up betraying him. But still in the midst of those stories, you find this possibility of a redemption on the other side of the greatest fall, on the other side of the greatest betrayal. Um, he does turn after betraying Christ, uh, having doubt in Christ, denying Christ, and indeed Boromir's turn in the last moments to fight and die for the fellowship. And so there's much more to say upon redemption. I wrote about that in the recent Substack. It's mirrored in the kingdom of Rohan, which has fallen into disrepair. The kingdom of Gondor, which is so painful for Baromir because he wants to fulfill, he wants to see his kingdom thrive, but it's, it's in a state of fallenness. And so I think there's a great deal of rich analogy for us as we look out into our own culture, as we stand as men of the West and see that our own culture is in a state of fallenness, our leaders are corrupt, aging, without heart, valor, and courage. Um, and in our personal lives, as I've spoken to. And so perhaps, Jordan, I'll just uh, pass it to you here on what comes up on redemption and then perhaps we can get into some of the more magical uh mythical components of this story as well mm. yeah thank you thank you jacob thank you brother this is a great theme to start with i think and um interestingly a couple of threads came up for me number one is actually around Gollum. um and redemption in relation to Gollum and how we see the love of Frodo and the kindness of Frodo actually act as like an olive branch reaching from the light of the heart to a creature that has become literally a complete shell of his former self, right? Like evil darkness, the dark magic of Sauron and the ring has corrupted him to the point where his soul is like barely even there anymore he's just like a an absolutely you know destitute um wretched creature and, and yet we see that the love of christ signified by frodo's pure heart um is actually able to start to reach smeagol within the shell of Gollum and able to start to elicit genuine um connection and genuine compassion that starts to come forth from Go from from Gollum from Smeagol and then we see his kind of split personality begin to manifest where the you know good-hearted Smeagol is at war with this kind of tyrannical satanic Gollum figure that has co-opted his body you could say but we see the possibility of extremely radical redemption through that to me that's really like one of the most powerful metaphors for just how far redemptive love can go and that you really, you, you cannot go too far away from home. The prodigal sons and daughters 
can never wander so far from home that they cannot be welcomed back through the love of God to the kingdom of heaven, um, or to use non-Christian language through the love of source, be welcomed back to the home of homes, which is just this moment now seen seen clearly. And so, and so, yeah, Gollum comes up strongly for me, and it also just raises the question of like. Uh, it, it inspires me to want to challenge Christians to go even further than they may have gone with the story of Lord of the Rings in terms of redemptive love and really ask themselves, what would it take for Sauron to be redeemed? What would it take for Saruman to be redeemed? What would it take for Shelob to be redeemed? What would it mean to shower them with the unconditional love of Christ and God just as equally as all the heroes um, and is it possible that all of creation could be redeemed and through that love? Um, so yeah, that's what, that's what arose for me. Wow. Well, that's really, really, uh, really powerful provocation. Um, I did actually read that Sauron and, uh, in the deep mythology of Tolkien is himself fallen. He's somebody who was in the light and he's fallen. So he fulfills that sensibility of the of the of the saint and figure of the lucifer figure who is in light and has fallen away from light and becomes kind of the negation of it but i think that does imply on some level that it is possible like like some powerful magic um but it does also seem that he is so so consumed in darkness that that like his destruction he just kind of like disappears like the whatever light is left in him is just dispersed like he he can't come back from that so that's a really interesting tension um and i'm really glad you pointed out the kind of christological quality of frodo um as the one who takes up the ring which is not too dissimilar to a cross and then he bears that through the journey and he's not the strongest he's not like Baromir with the big hardy warrior body he's just a little hobbit and there's nothing particular about him except from his heart and his courage and a little bit of exploratory spirit that allows him to take on this burden that is so much greater than him and uh, this quote that I included in the one of the postings, you know, he says, I know what I must do, but I'm afraid to do it. And it's so like that, that place of doubt, that place of like wrestling with wrestling with God, wrestling with destiny, wrestling with our own purpose, um, struggling to realize it and indeed calling on aid. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about Tolkien's universe is even though we're thrown into the most difficult quest of our lives, which actually seems like an impossible task. There are these helpers that come along the way and, and give gifts and give guidance at different moments. And we see that in the elves and so on. And ultimately that speaks to, I think, the spirit of fellowship, which in Tolkien, Tolkien's universe is not one, it's not a religious world explicitly. It's not one in which people are, uh, worshiping uh, divinity, but there's this devotion to fellowship which comes through, and and that's ultimately the strength that allows them to overcome unbelievable, unbelievable odds. So, yeah, there's two directions I really want to pull through with this. Um, one of them is how this spirit of the fellowship and the courage of the small in the face of the great, um, how that speaks to the liminal web, the wisdom commons, and the kind of hope for humanity as we head through this meta-crisis, poly-crisis moment, this kind of eye of the needle moment um, in which a lot of people um, earnestly striving feel disempowered a lot of people in the limb 
and all web are asking, how do we scale this? How do we create um, a larger a larger body? How do we create a church? Just want to welcome Ken. Good to have you here, my friend. We've just been uh, delving into redemption and the courage of the small. And uh, yeah, I'd love to have your remarks in a few moments uh, when you're settled in and so on. Um, so I see in the liminal web, there's this sensibility that we need to scale, we need to find a way to create this kind of like army of the good, or we need to like figure out how to spread different ways of being and different consciousness throughout the population at large in order to overcome the juncture that we are facing. And yet in the Fellowship of the Ring, you see only nine set out from Rivendell, only nine, small in number. And part of their strength seems to be actually that they are undetectable. Sauron doesn't suspect that the nine would uh, be threatening at all. The hobbits are able to slip under his gaze. And in the same way, I think a lot of the, the wisest and most spiritually powerful people in the liminal web you know they're not seen as a threat to the powers that be by any measure it's seen as like this obscure meaningless thing and that may well be precisely what gives it the power to move unseen and i love this sense that the fellowship and that and the actors within the fellowship are able to make these small interventions that shift the tides of the age they're able to steward the greater forces at play and of course, there are greater forces, there's huge armies, there's huge battles, and they're kind of weaving their way through the tides of the age, just pushing things a bit that way, pushing things a bit this way. Um, you see that in Gandalf as the wizard, you see that in Frodo appealing to Faramir's better nature to let him go forth and so on. And so this juncture, I'd love to hear um, what comes up for you guys, you know, as we kind of draw out the wisdom of Tolkien for our own time. Um, yeah, I can jump back in here. Uh, nice to see you again, Ken. Um, one of the one thing that came up still on the redemption topic, and then I'll, I'll connect it to and say something about the new topic. But before I forget, this is just really interesting. Um, background about Tolkien. So yeah, in his novel, The Silmarillion, I, if that's how you pronounce it, he goes into like the deep <clears throat> history and the cosmology <clears throat> and really the like the theology of the Lord of the Rings universe. And he can't remember the name, but Sauron actually has like a boss. There's, there's a boss of Sauron who's like kind of the, the ultimate. It's Morgoth. Morgoth. Yeah. He's like the ultimate Satan figure um, in that universe. And he started out, yeah, as one of these kind of demigod like figures who were meant to, you know, rule har harmoniously. But then he was kind of attracted to discord in a sense. And Tolkien uses these music metaphors, which I think is really cool. And what I want, the point I wanted to raise though about that was just that um, Tolkien makes a really interesting comment that for all the discord that Morgoth and his minions, Sauron and his armies sought to create and did create, that discord was still part of the larger harmony that the, that, um, the, the deity, whatever the creator of that universe was, that creator's harmony like factored in the discord and so the and the discord ultimately ultimately only contributed to a more beautiful piece of music um in the larger um scheme of things so yeah i just think i think that's a really fascinating frame to look at jrr tolkien's metaphysics in that sense and to see that like on the deepest level he was suggesting that nothing was actually out of order um that the discord even the, even the most disgusting forms of discord were, were still in a sense part of the divine plan or part of the divine music and um and yeah um and uh, and as and hearkening back to what i said earlier and and also had the potential to be redeemed and kind of 
Well, I guess uh, I don't know if Tolkien himself expressed that per se, but earlier, Ken, I was just kind of talking about the possibility of offering redemption even to Sauron and Saruman and Shelob and all like the darkest figures in the Lord of the Rings universe and just offering that radical possibility. So anywho, I just want to drop that piece in and yeah, I guess I can briefly connect it to the liminal web by just saying that um, I think one should never underestimate and can never underestimate the the world altering power of universal unconditional love and people who are completely unknown and obscure and not in the spotlight, but they hold that type of love in their heart and they're grounding that on earth and emanating that to every single being without exception and really going all the way with the, you know, what you do to the least among me, you do to me taking that all the way to like, we are also emanating that love to Sauron and to Satan and to the most the most fallen, quote unquote, fallen beings. Um, yeah, what what could happen from there? So. Yeah, that's that's really wonderful. I um, it's good to see you all. Uh, I apologize for being a little bit late. Things have been uh, a bit hectic in my life the last week, so I really appreciate your graciousness, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, Renick, it's nice to nice to see you. I haven't met you before. Um, and Mark, although your camera's off. Um, yeah, I guess to, I'll just jump in here with this thread because Jordan, thank you for bringing in the music. Um, I, Lord of the Rings for me is a, I don't know, maybe in some ways I, it's almost my, one of my primary mythologies through which I, and by that, I mean like story patterns through which I see reality. And I don't know that it landed to the depth it did until I heard the heard the stories and understood the the music of Iluvatar. That 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 the the metaphysics of Tolkien's universe is that God Iluvatar sings the universe into being. And he has the Ainur, these demigods, like you said, who are surrounding him and sort of amplifying the music. And there's this notion of this, this, this inner pure music that get, then gets amplified. And then Melkor's, because it's Melkor first, who becomes Morgoth, but Melkor introduces the discord. It's called the discord of Melkor. And then there's, there's these, the, the fallen angels around Melkor sort of pick up on his discord. And then there's, there's, then I believe if I remember correctly, they stop singing. There's three different songs and it happens in three consecutive um, it's like the first song, Melkor introduced Discord at the very end. And the second one is like some joining Melkor throughout in his Discord. And then the third is like a lot of Discord. And then the final is one, like one note only from Iluvatar of complete purity and perfection that ends the whole thing. Which for me is like, I mean, there's so much of just the Christian, like the Christian metaphysic is, is, all throughout that but then like to connect that then to this notion that you brought in jacob of the the simple goodness being being the answer like in that we find ourselves caught up in these massive movements of history and these you know this sort of cultural upheaval and and upheaval of philosophy upheaval of religion in this moment that we live in now and it's it's Frodo and Sam, the weakest that survive on hope alone, right? Like Sam's Sam's speech in uh, Minas Tirith with the uh, right after the um, after the ring wraith, you know, dusts them off the top of that off the top of that uh, little cross bridge, and you know, uh, they roll down and then uh, or. Sam Sam tackles him down and then you know Frodo comes up with the knife about to kill him and he says you know he goes Sam goes through his speech you know it's that in the in the great stories you know that people people didn't give up people didn't give up no matter what because they had something they were holding on to and then Frodo says you know what are we holding on to Sam said that, that there's some good in this world 
and it's worth fighting for. And for me, Sam is the beating heart of Tolkien and Lord of the Rings. And among everything else wonderful that Sam is, is he's sort of the essence of hope that that bears, you know, that that iconic and end of the third movie where 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 Sam says I forget what the quote is exactly, but Sam picks up Frodo and carries him up the mountain. He says, you know, you may not be I may not be able to carry the ring for you, but I can carry you. That's what it is. And he picks him up and he carries him up the mountain. It's like there does come that time when we are when we are just the simple because inevitably we are only ever simple. But we can do our best and we can hope against hope even when we're in the depths of Mordor. And there's something about <clears throat> the vision of the world that Tolkien saw that I think can give us hope no matter where we find ourselves in our personal lives battling, say, dark spiritual forces like we had talked about a week ago. Or when we're looking at the big picture and unable to understand how how could you know it's in in Sam's speech sometimes you didn't want to know the end because how could the end be good how could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened that was beautiful ken and i just need to jump in and highlight the additional Christic symbolism of Sam carrying Frodo up the mountain because J- Jacob had pointed out the Christic figure of Frodo bearing the cross of the ring. But I love actually that Tolkien, it's kind of like a plot twist, like, but Frodo was not in a sense strong enough to just take the ring on his own. He needed a fellow brother in Christ, a fellow brother connected to that pure, simple good to bear his own cross, which was Frodo, carry Frodo up the mountain. And it also makes me think of that in a line in Christianity, like, and when there were only one pair of footprints, I was carrying you. Um, And yeah, there's just so much, so much there, like, like pure goodness emanated in that symbolism. So, yeah. And that's one of the things that I think makes it a real myth is that I've tried a bunch of times to sort of build interpretations of Lord of the Rings. Um, and even say like, that's why I'm even hesitant to say that Sam is hope because in some sense, yes, but also like he, he always slips you because everything's too real to be held to just an interpretation. Yeah, no, it's uh, it goes all the way down and further still. It feels like, um, and the sense of like story within story within story really speaks to that. Like, there's we're always kind of thrown into story, um, and part of why I've called this event, called this council, is my sense that we are always thrown into story, and yet have been thrown into a kind of fragmentation or absence of story. And it's not that it's done away with, it's that it's substituted with confusion or less deeply fulfilling stories. Um, Yeah, I'm going to actually scut this a little bit to the side because there's some huge, huge pieces to bring in. And then um, perhaps at the hour then we'll pivot into open forum and I'd love to hear anything coming up with Rennick and Mark and we can even talk about writing our own myths. Um, this, so the two pieces here for me first is, you know, Elrond's words, um, at the council of Elrond, each race is bound to this one fate, this one doom. There's a, there's a unifying quality in that crisis, which obviously was reflected, has been reflected throughout the last century really the the world wars were the epitome of this and i think that's why they inspired tolkien and inspired telihard de jardin and others to develop these grand visions and and mythologies and so there's a sense in which there's a prophecy being fulfilled here the possibility of a totalizing all-seeing eye 
has never been more palpable than it is right now. The prospect that some consolidation of power can track everything you do, every step, every move is tracked through your cell phone. Everything you buy, everything you do can be watched and controlled. And of course, the other message that comes with that is that that totalizing power is always, always corrupting. And even the most stout of heart, even the most pure and angelic of heart from Aragon to Galadriel, they all recognize the truth of that, that corrupting power. And so this is a huge, huge message for leaders and for those who are actually holding power in the world to look at the Lord of the Rings and to see what happens when you, when you grab the ring of power and you're tempted and that nobody is free of that temptation. Nobody is free of it. Alongside that, um, drawing a lot on the recent Emerald podcast for the intuitives in which uh, Joshua Shri, Shri really delved into the sense of intuitives, visionaries, seers, channels, people who hear voices, people who enter into non-ordinary states and have access to different ways of knowing that this is actually a really important piece that has been suppressed and eradicated from modernity, but that that eradication has not been successful and those capacities still live in some cultures explicitly and in cultures like our own often um, suppressed and unfulfilled, leading people into despair or mental illness because they cut off parts of themselves which are essential and so i take a lot of inspiration in tolkien and in his friend c.s lewis's cosmos trilogy um like both of these stories hold a beautiful and inviting world in which the reality of dreams visions miraculous healings um all of these things are just as as plain as day they are reality. They govern the world of the people in them as much as story governs their world. And it seems to me that this is part of what is needed for the eye of the needle that we face collectively. Like the sense that what we're facing cannot be trodden, cannot be passed through by any powers that we here possess. There's a need to connect to other powers and other ways of knowing and participating other forms of intelligence collective intelligence um in order to navigate the meta crisis and so in both of these respects i'm really feeling a, an alive way in which lord of the rings um pulls that forth for us and uh it would be remiss for me to not mention that it was in the context of plant medicine ceremonies in december that this theme really came to life, um, hearing that Lord of the Rings had been coming through for Jordan in various visions, and then later for me as well, and just feeling the the pertinence of that in a sense that we actually, that, that this kind of mythical level is always adjacent and present for us. And right now we're just in a, a culture where the mythic layer has been deracinated uh, and dried out. And it's still there, but it's just not, uh, it's not flourishing as it should be. Yeah, one of the things I like about that framing is that it feels like it, it can be really hard when you have the capacity to tune in to, like, what, what was the word you used, non, non-normal, non-normal consciousness or non-normal? Yeah, um, different ways of knowing. Yeah, like when when you can when you can tune into things that in our upbringing in the modern world we would have thought were just sort of illusory or non-real. It can be really challenging because the way that it's been suppressed, maybe in the past it was sort of actively suppressed, but now it seems to be suppressed suppressed just sort of by suspicion and and a hollowing out of any way of making sense of them. Right, because nobody treats it as real, and it's like, well, then you're just floating in empty space. So you might have a vision, you might hear from, from, 
either someone who's passed or a spirit or something. And if you don't have a lens through which to, to, to filter it, it just, it gets very confusing. And I've seen, I've seen people close to me go through really, really devastating things because they had no, because they didn't think any of it was real. And then all of a sudden the weight of it was so real that it just broke all their frames. And I think something like Lord of the Rings and these other mythic structures, if we can allow it to move into the liminal space of understanding it, it's not fantasy, right? But it's not a journalistic representation of history either. It's somewhere in between, and it can hold us in that liminal space when we encounter patterns that are above us and beyond us. Can I jump in here? Can you guys hear me? Jacob? It's contra structure, Mark, but I'm going to trust your impulse. It's please, what please go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. And if you, if yeah. you want to be on camera, you're welcome. I've got this thing about deep fake and being recorded and stuff like that. So I'm going to stay off for a little bit. Um, the idea that it's not real is, is uh, it, it just struck me. I got to leave in a little bit, but I had to drop this in here is that the, one of the leading physicists in the world who works at the Large Hadron Collider in order to um, track gluons scatter. He loaded the, the formulas into a hyperdimensional space called the Grass Manion. And that already sounds like something from Tolkien. And so it's like he prayed to this a space that was outside of space time and said, help us. And then out of that, formed a jewel-like geometrical object called the amplitohedron. And the amplitohedron, from that space, gave them something in space-time that helped them do something that supercomputers couldn't do. They could do it on paper. It took something uh, like non-locality, so how do these gluons affect each other from um, far away in space? And how does everything become one uh, with Unitarianism? Unitarianism, I think it's called, something like that. It's, and I wrote, as I was coming up uh, to do that, um, the Recovering the Mystery Through the Heart of Rationality, that we walk in two worlds, like Jung talked about it. We cut ourselves off from pure awareness so that we can have rationality within space, time, and have the scientific method. But that is still there. That world is actually still there. And the physicists are just starting to discover it. Arkani Hamed has said space time is doomed. So what we are seeing is, he said, to do real science, we've got to go beyond space time into this uh, world that is beyond it. So is Donald Hoffman and others. This is what we have to do. So when Ken just said, um, we don't consider it real, I just wanted to point out that on the leading edges of, edges of science, they say that's where we have to go. So, and that's why I think this frame helps, is that uh, any kind of frame that helps bring that in, so for us to become aware that we do walk in two worlds. Our bodies walk in the world of pure weirdness all the time. It's just our minds cut it off, as Jung talked about, just so we could do um, the scientific method and rationality. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, no, that feels um, that feels really pertinent, and that's very helpful for me because I had been, I think, resonating deeply with that sense, like starting to open up that felt sense of there is this kind of layer above, there is this mythic layer, um, which, especially in altered states, takes on a very different reality, and there's this profoundly strange shift that I underwent from like. These are just Hollywood films or these are just really good stories that I've been seemingly attracted to for my entire life and kept being drawn to again and again to like popping outside of my own perspectival relationship to that and the context of modernity and just being like, what is going on when we're in relationship to these stories that we've created? Like, 
there's a there's a reality to that that has started to dawn to me and it's very difficult to put into words but i really appreciate mark you introducing the scientific layer to that because it does seem that so many of the innovations that have afforded our um somewhat abstracting technological world have come down from that same imaginal level that you when you talk to the deep mathematicians um and how these theories come about sometimes they do come from dreams or sometimes something <clears throat> comes down and they don't know what it's going to be for and it's only 50 years later that that piece slots into place and opens up like our entire metaphysical reality our entire understanding of space-time um and so you know we're all building on each other's metaphysical objects to build new realities in this in this kind of space between worlds so i wanted to yeah throw it back to jordan and ken and see if there's anything else um on those last few threads one thing that comes up for me is just um jordan peterson makes this point really nicely that the great miss in a sense are more real than human life because they are distillations of so much wisdom collected across time and ages that they actually compress um, so much reality into a single story that it it takes on like a hyper reality a super reality it becomes more real than just a single human life and in the case of Tolkien, you know, he's he's different from like the great myths that formed over ages and ages of cultures in a sense. I mean, he obviously was a great student of mythology and was distilling things. But I think also it's possible for someone like him to just like channel a story like that that is almost almost a super reality and it contains so much signification so much significance that it's it's more real than real and we we can learn a lot from that and one last piece just to mention was that um you know people can do what they want with this i don't know exactly what to do with it but when i had these visions on ayahuasca a few months ago of lord of the rings the download that i got was not just that this is real in like a mythic layer of reality but that like this is another dimension of reality. There is another universe where this actually happened. And we needed that story in this universe. So it kind of hopped across. It, it was channeled into this universe through Tolkien. And I, yeah, was even, I mean, I was seeing, I remember meeting Elrond so vividly and having like a, a feeling like, I'm pretty sure it was communicated to me that I myself my soul was legolas in that universe and you know this could easily again i don't know what to do with this i don't take these types of things too uh i don't i don't grab onto them too tightly but i also don't just completely dismiss them uh, i think reality is just way stranger than we give it we typically give it credit for so uh, yeah that, that's what came up for me one one piece I'll add to that, Jordan, when Peter Jackson was launching the Lord of the Rings project, I'll see if I can uh, pull up the quote here because it deeply connects with what you just said. Um, sorry, just one moment. Uh, he says, uh, we've been given the job of making the Lord of the Rings. And I said, look, from this point on, I want to think that the Lord of the Rings was actually real, that it was actually history, that these events happened. And more than that, I want us to imagine that we've been lucky enough to go on location and shoot where those events happened. So it was the very notion that it was real that allowed the telling of the story to be, you know, the greatest thing captured on film in recent decades, probably, possibly all time. Um, I would seriously entertain that. And uh, yeah, we got to hold space for those ayahuasca visions in the liminal web because there's some passing out to do and some of them uh some of them are going to have real real implications for how we interpret our time and not every vision that comes through but some visions that come through are precisely what is going to crack 
open the kind of sinking ship uh, of modernity and allow us to pass out in ways that we can't. Yeah, we got to rap about them too, Renek. I really like, yeah. <laughs> Ken, what comes up for you hearing uh, hearing all that? Well, I love the I love the ayahuasca journey with Elrond. That's awesome. Um, and also, I mean, you know, there's something about being being chosen for resonance with a particular archetype, right? Like Legolas is an archetype. Um, and whatever else it means having the capacity to feel oneself truly called into participation with an archetype is, is, is a powerful, powerful thing. And yeah, I mean, I would say if there's one thing that I've become very convinced of in watching how often the narrative of events in current framing can be changed and can one day you know, one day we we hear that someone has said something and the next day it's been changed to something else. And then you think about if that happens in real time, well, how much of that has happened in the past? I think we actually probably know very, very little about our past as human beings. I mean, even even from a just the basic standpoint of our 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 oldest history is maybe maybe six thousand years old. With archaeology, maybe we can touch back. 14, 14,000 some years with Gobekli Tepe. And, you know, our best guess of how long humans has been around is like 75,000 to 150,000. It's like, it's a long time. <laughs> there's, there's a lot, there's a lot happened in there. And there's good evidence to say there's some been, been some pretty massive cataclysms in the world. So, you know, we don't, we don't even necessarily have to say it was a different universe that these sorts of things happened. We could just say, well, maybe it was 60,000 years ago and, you know, only the rocks remember. Um, but yeah, I think I think changing the frame that way for me, one of the things it does is loosen up the grip of the seeming reality of the rationalistic scientific frame, right? We're instead of being so convinced that that's the really real thing, flipping it around and saying, no, that's 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 really not how it is. And I wanted to comment also on the this idea of like insights, scientific and mathematical insights sort of coming down from above and how, yeah, I mean, there's so many stories of that happening, right? Like how um, Einstein, I think it was Einstein, would would sit in his chair to fall asleep and with, with metal balls in his hand so that as he would drift into sleep, the balls would fall and hit the ground and wake him up because he understood that it was at the borderline land of his consciousness that he had the most insight. So he would, he would write down whatever it was, whatever thought it was that came to him. Like he would sit, he would sit in his chair with these balls in his hand, try to fall asleep. And as he would fall asleep, the balls would fall, wake him up. And then he'd write down in a notebook, whatever it was that came to him, which totally makes sense when we think about how we understand cog cognitive function to work in terms of um, the, the need to, um, to avoid overfitting to the data, right? especially with the these large language models, we've learned this that that if if you find you find a pattern in the data and then they overfit to the data until you introduce noise into the system and shake it up, so that break frame and reframe, right? And it's like that that capacity to break your framing and then build a new frame. That's the thing that we need. That's the thing that we want. And that only happens in the liminal space. That is a beautiful, beautiful segue to what I was feeling called to add at this moment. Um, also going to invite Rennick if he has any uh, contributions. I know you have to leave in a little while, but uh, super stoked to have you here with us. Rennick is actually part of the men's uh, brotherhood that Jordan uh, has been running and I've been participating in. Um. There's something, there's an intuition that I started to glean as I was writing the second piece, which I was trying to rush through and get out before this event, but it wanted more time. So that's going to come 
later in the week, but really connecting, talking and liminal web. And I was wondering almost like from a zoomed out standpoint, like what is actually going on here? What are we cultivating when we're entering these liminal spaces, when we're training this capacity to be in this place of uncertainty, to be in this place where things can be spoken through spontaneously. And I wondered whether in fact, we are not tilling the ground or cultivating the soil of story when we are doing these practices of liminality. And that the liminal web might well be the kind of birthing ground of story of the of the stories that uh take us beyond where we currently are and so that's a really um it's a really interesting notion because i'd often viewed the liminal web as like it's it's been a departure from a broken story or an old story or a dying story into a place in between stories but i had not really entertained the possibility that actually what we're doing here is starting to understand the essence of story including aesthetic which is something i think is really important for us to pour into our creations and our creative vision the last piece i wanted to add um was just to to dial in the strangeness that i experienced at kumankaya uh, retreat center with jordan in december um that place had a rivendell like quality that I wrote about. I think there are certain places where the beauty is so cultivated, you feel the beauty has been pulled down from some elven kind of inspirational realm. And there was a, a French visionary artist at the retreat who I had seen a number of times lying on a hammock looking very, very elvish. And I had not spoken to him at all. I had just seen him. And there was a little bit of like, whoa, like I don't even know how to relate to this beautiful elvish energy that this guy's uh, dwelling in. And of course, being in that retreat center and being in the jungle and working with those medicines, there was already an altered perceptivity. So the next night I went into ayahuasca ceremony number one, and all of this Lord of the Rings stuff was coming through from what possibly due to Jordan's prompting of his own story. And I kept on revisiting this, this French visionary artist. And I was like, why, why like in the vision space, it was like, why is he with Lord of the Rings? And like, I feel like he's an elf and I've kind of like shifted into some other reality in which I'm encountering a kind of like a last Lothlorian like um person and the next day i came out i mentioned it to him he didn't respond to it directly he was just like yeah if that keeps coming up for you maybe you're getting stuck you know don't get attached to any stories that come up but then like a day or two later i went through his artistic folio which was at the retreat center and then like the second page there's this self-portrait of him as an elf like full tolkien lord of the Rings style armor like uh elrond's armor kind of on the ground next to him and it's just like it's all there and it's like how the f did that kind of come through so clearly and lucidly in the vision space without any direct prompting and so it speaks to the confoundment and just dwelling with the confoundment as Jordan has done with his own story kind of agnostically, like, let it be there, be curious about it. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. That's the way that I heard Ken in our wrestling with Christianity dialogue speak to the mysteries of Christianity as well. Like maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. I don't know the full possibility of what's possible. So that was a lot. Um, Rennick, how are you doing? So, uh, uh, I'm doing well. I'm Lord of the Rings pulse for you. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm doing well. I'm just grateful to, to be in the space of listening. Um, yeah, I, so I have an, a kind of an admission 
I completed. I haven't read the Lord of the Ring bo Rings books, but I completed the the last movie like a week and a half ago. So the the mythos, the mythology of the Lord of the Rings is very fresh. Although the timing of watching the movies was spaced out, so my sense is that rewatching them a few more times would help all of the constellations and uh environments and just the whole world that is the lord of the rings like set in a little deeper um but i have noticed just in listening to this conversation little trickles and whispers of of like um just reconnecting with the storyline and like almost remembering parts of it um so grateful for that um but i don't really have much to like offer as far as like uh yeah like i just don't feel like i'm i i know enough about it to really offer a lot to the space the conversation but i'm i'm grateful to to be here listening and I do want to read the books eventually and, and kind of let the mythology of it all set in deeper. Um, but it was really, um, I, I think I started watching the first movie maybe in, maybe we, we started that in late January and started the return of the King during the King archetype month that we were in, in the brothers of the ever innocent mm -hmm. part. Uh, group that we're in and that was that was definitely helpful to feel into more of what the the king archetype is because yeah i just haven't really felt into or connected with that archetype much throughout my life <laughs> still in a very very much a path of evolution and growth and uh yeah oh so, yeah i'll just leave it at that I, but it, it's a it's an absolutely beautiful story, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to for more conversations like this uh, to to unfold and to to learn, continue to learn more about it and feel into the metaphors from it in my own life. That was dope. That was dope. Thank you, Rene. It's good to have you here, and I'm really excited that you've cracked open Lord of the Rings this year. I mean. I've watched it pretty much every year for as long as I can remember. And uh, I never get tired, never gets old. Uh, and I will say that it wasn't until this last year that it kind of cracked open for me in this new way. For a long time, it was just a, a source of joy and solace, and adventure, a, a story that I liked to make my home in. Um, but there's something new going on now that is, that is starting to appear. And I really appreciate that connection to the Council of Kings, the return of the king. And uh, I think that's a real indication of what we can do um, as people engaged in space holding. Jordan holds a lot of spaces. I hold spaces and facilitate, can also hold space in groups in various ways. Like we as space holders can be resourced from this mythology and it doesn't mean we just do like Lord of the Rings themed stuff. <laughs> it means we we recognize the essential aesthetic mythological nature of what we can invite people into at this time. And that's something I've always I sought to do with my past men's initiatives was kind of give it a little bit of that aesthetic and invitation. And I see that too in Jordan's call to the Council of Kings and Yeah, it feels feels really important that we recognize that and start to kind of create that fauna and that richness that can then spread its seeds in unexpected ways. And I like that. Um, oh, sorry, Jordan. Let me just real quick that um, that notion of sort of resource for space holding. Um. I think that's part of that hope that I was referring to earlier. You know, there's this thing that I'm sure you guys have had this experience when you're when you're leading a group or attempting to create a space for for legitimate soul work to happen. 
where you find yourself very much in the situation that the fellowship is in, in the caves of Moria. When, when you're sort of, you find yourself in a dead end where, and, and the, you know, the goblins are breaking down the door and the, you know, there's this fight happening and you don't know where to turn and all those sorts of things. And to have, to have various frames and spaces of myths that, that can hold you in that space and you can actually sort of look for places to move and escape, escape or open new space. And you can, at least for me, I, I'll even sort of visualize myself in, like I'll feel, it'll, it's like a feeling. You get the feeling of that situation, whether it's the Caves of Moria or, you know, uh, or, or Gandalf with the Balrog or, or Frodo and Sam on Mount Doom, right? There's, there's all these spaces where you can sort of, like I'll get the feeling of that space. I'm like, oh, that's where we are right now. Like it feels dark and heavy and all these things, and this is where we are. Okay, what 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 sort of space? What sort of thing did the did the did these people do? How did they move? And like sometimes you need to be Gandalf and just like, you know, this is where it ends, right? I'll I'll stand here. You guys, you guys go away, but you thou shall you shall not pass, right? And and I've done that before in those sorts of spaces, um, but having <clears throat> having the grounding of that sort of framing for me, um, I think that's part of why Lord of the Rings has been so important is because it's not the only one that has those sorts of things for me, but it has many, um, and I've found it to be really powerful in that way. Yeah, Jordan, if you have anything, uh, please feel welcome. One other experiment I wanted to do today inspired by what we've been doing in, in your brotherhood is actually a, a little writing time. So uh, after your next remarks, I want to give us all five minutes, Renick, you might have to pop off um, to write from the place of this conversation and to write from the place of what, what mythology are we draw, you know, what mythology wants to speak through us in this moment or this time. And so we can take five minutes to write on that and see if anything uh, comes through that, that is better drawn out through the pen than the word. Yeah, um, just a couple quick remarks. Um, there's a few threads here. The archetype of the reluctant king was coming up. Like I feel Aragorn is the reluctant king and ironically, paradoxically, the greatest kings are often the ones who don't see them as kings, themselves as kings, don't want to be kings, aren't drawn to just have power for the sake of power and dominate, but have to be, you know, guided by life into that nobility and service to the realm. And I think it's cool to ask, like, in what ways do Frodo and Sam also embody the reluctant king, not just Aragorn, who's, you know, one of the more obvious kings in the story, but like, yeah. You know, we talked about Frodo and Sam in relation to the figure of Christ, who is called the King of Kings. Um, and why is Christ called the King of Kings, I think, is a beautiful question. And can we see, you know, the Christic image of Frodo bearing the cross of the ring and Sam bearing the cross of Frodo as some of the most kingly um, behaviors that occur in the story? And can we begin to purify the king archetype of all of the baggage that it has accumulated? Because most people associate the king with, you know, the Donald Trumps of the world, the dictators and the and the power seekers and the the gaudy, you know, decadent, where's my gold throne? You know, can we can we reclaim that archetype and purify it? Um, and and a quote from Lao Tzu came to mind where he says, He who loves the earth as his own body is fit to rule the empire. And so I, I love that quote, and I feel like it, again, points to the, the purified king archetype, like the true king is profoundly connected to the deepest wisdom in all of our hearts, is profoundly connected to that universal, unconditional love that was mentioned earlier. And it requires that unbelievable humility of loving the earth as one's own body and placing nothing below oneself to be able to hold that post um, nobly and skillfully. 
And then the last thing that came up just in relation to what Ken was just sharing, since he brought up the you shall not pass piece um, with Gandalf in the Balrog, you shall not pass, just reminded me of the craziest thing in my life. One of the literal craziest things that ever happened to me was after this ayahuasca retreat uh, in 2019, where the shaman who I was romantically involved with broke my heart right before the retreat, broke up with me, but I still went to her retreat and she served me four cups of strong ayahuasca four nights in a row. And I, with my heart shattered and I just had to like, I was setting an intention to somehow let her go, even though I'm madly in love with this like dark haired, you know, um, Slavic woman wanting to run off with her. So I had this, this, the retreat itself was absolutely insane. And that's a story for another time, but immediately after the retreat, I had this like trauma release massage, actually two trauma release massages in the span of a week that turned into literal, like multi-dimensional battlegrounds, borderline, like exorcism type of things where the normal personality of Jordan Bates was just off to the side somewhere, barely anywhere to be found. And my voice literally changed to like an ancient, like old man voice. And I was involuntarily just like saying things like, so not so, like I, I was like, you know, this, this might be too much for people to share this, but I was literally just like writhing and like foaming at the mouth and like crazy, crazy stuff was going on. It was one of the deepest purges of my life, but it literally felt like a, a like higher self or a version of me from another dimension, like came in and occupied my body to do battle with ancient forces and ancient kind of karmic contracts that were being broken thing something that was being released and yeah this ver i don't know it was it was it was very strange and very ancient and this voice was yeah my voice turned into an old man voice for like hours and was like you don't know who i am <laughs> and it was yeah just bizarre so another anecdote of the strangeness of reality that I don't know exactly what to do with, but it's interesting to drop into the space. That was really powerful. I'm I'm really happy to receive that story here. This is precisely the kind of things that I hope to make space for in Sensebase Studio, uh, Sensebase Live. Sorry mm -hmm. to, uh, to to have a space where those inexplicable fragments can be attended to. So in this moment. I'm going to pause the recording, and if y'all want to grab a piece of paper, we will take five minutes to write. All right, so we've just had our five minutes. Uh, I'm really glad to be hosting this kind of experimental format with SenseBase and seeing what comes through using multimedia. So. Uh, as always, uh, totally optional if you want to share what came through directly or just what's what's inspired out of it. And um, yeah, no expectations really. This is just a, a play at at uh, play at alchemy. So uh, with that, perhaps I'll courageously begin and share just a little bit of what came through for me. Um, Man is always fallen. There is always a call. The man who heeds it faces death. For the one who has fallen must continually give way to the one that heeds, the one being born. Ours is a fellowship of life and death. With our breath, we call down realities yet unmanifest. We hear the whisper and compose a kingdom. We heed the call and redeem the fall. Beautiful. Thank you, Jacob. Um, I can share next. Um, so what I wrote was um, love. All discord is part of a larger harmony. Iluvatar, life, trust. All crises 
are made of non-crisis. Peace, love, infinity, beautiful cosmos, dragon Bible, universal redemption, all beings saved. And I drew a burning heart. And <laughs> dragon Bible is a reference to a song that I made in 2022. Um, so if people want to look that up, they can find it on the internet. It's a it's one of the craziest stories, it's probably the craziest story that I ever wrote. It's called the Dragon Bible. So, yeah, very mythical. So, anyway, cute. That was awesome. You know, the words that really landed for me there was all crisis is made of non crisis. And Renick, you got anything? Uh, anything you want to add here? Anything coming through? Sure, I'll share. <clears throat> yeah, that's what came through, short and sweet. Be silent and still, my child, but go forth. The birds chirp loudest at dawn. They give, they give. There's no certificate to live or to love. The top of the cross rises to the above and lowers to the ground below. Mm. Beautiful poetry, Rennick, as always. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, I can share mine. Mine is definitely a different sort of note. Um, I'm not sure where it came from. Um, I awaken in a dim room. My head aches and slowly the gray fog of sleep recedes from my vision. And then, nothing. The usual flood of thoughts, the strains which pick me up so reliably upon waking. Like a wave carrying the kelp, simply do not arrive. There is no story, no tell of yesterday, no worry and no connection, only an empty room. A screen glows on the table. I was really interesting. And definitely a different note. <laughs> yeah, I was getting that sense, some sense of connection with the Moria image, but then it was also evoking the first chapter of uh, 1984 for me as well. Um, so yeah, if you, I don't know, if you'd like to speak more to, to that, you're welcome to. And um, yeah, we're, we're at 90 minutes now, so kind of in the, the closing uh closing part of the dialogue and we can go for, for however long feels right but uh yeah i yeah, um really i do should. need to go shortly but i'd like to comment on it briefly because i was sort of wondering about that especially as you were all sharing and i wonder this sort of two worlds thing that we're talking about right there's this little myth thing that i just wrote there as compared to the three that you all shared yours all three of yours had this deep meaningful sense of being drawn into an aspirational and mine was felt like the sort of other side of the the meaninglessness of the modern world and i'm wondering if that's sort of why sort of that coming together of realizing like that's the ground that we're trying to call to in our story making. We're trying to tell a new story to the person who wakes up in the blank room with a screen. Mm. The, the piece that shone out for me also in that was like after the, the kind of headache is cleared, there's like an okayness it's not necessary that like uh, I opened the event speaking to this hunger for story 
Um, but the reality is that there's a kind of somewhat thin but sufficiently satisfying gruel um, that means for the most part, and maybe this is also an expression of the resilience and, and hopeful nature of human beings that for the most part, uh, people get like Sam, you know, they get on and they feel okay. But unlike Sam, they don't necessarily have that story to draw down upon when the going gets really tough. And right now the going is getting tougher and tougher indeed so yeah i just really appreciate that tone of like contentment that kind of brave new world like we're not actually looking for anything more we're just content with with the room and the screen interestingly ken's description brought up for me a sense of almost a kind of liberation or a peace or an enlightenment of like the space beyond the stories the space beyond needing to be connected to apparently separate things or beings in a world of separate objects but just kind of dissolving into this spaceless space beyond words beyond stories beyond typical human needs and and potentially there being like uh, a beauty, a peace, a freedom in that. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, interesting how we all have our own ways of interpreting different things. But that's what came up for me in relation to that. How beautiful. Thank you, Jacob. This has been wonderful. That's been yeah. great having you guys. Thank you for heeding the call. And um, it's definitely been inspired by my conversations with both of you, the, the notion of doing this. So, uh, yeah, really cool. glad to see things unfolding organically through us all. And I'm excited to see what comes next. Me too. Yeah, thank you for the initiative. Jacob, it's been great. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you, brother. Good to be here. Looking forward to more of these. Thank and you, are we uh, open invitation? Like if we wanted to invite uh, close compadres and... Yes, yeah, def <laughs> definitely, definitely. Okay. All right, thank you all for listening and uh, stay tuned. Where's that dang record button? <laughs>